Hello, everyone. This is Mary Keurig with Frontrunners Innovate, and you're going to see two lovely faces <laughs> with me today. We have Akwasi Alpong Fasu, and Akwasi is the former uh, Minister of State for Governance and Public Policy um, in Ghana. And so we so appreciate having you with us, sir. And we're going to get to know a little bit about his background and the work that he's doing now because he has migrated his. Uh, leadership and his governance experience and everything into a consultancy. We're going to find out what that's all about and how that impacts Africa. And with yeah. me as co-host today is Ambassador Ghazala Khan. And Ambassador Khan is a representative of Pakistan with the Federal uh, Federation of International Gender and Human Rights and is a policymaker and just a, a wonderful policymaker at that because we've had her connected with lots of young up-and-coming policymakers. And she trains on diplomacy and um, governance. Uh, so welcome to both of you. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mary. And uh, Ambassador Khan, pleasure meeting you. And uh, thank you for arranging to have this conversation. This is going to be great. Pleasure as well. Yes. Thank yeah. you so much. So um, Akwasi, let's start with your background, find out a little bit about you and uh, what brought you into sort of the political and governing world. Uh, in Ghana. So the floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, I went into public office very early uh, in life as um, a mayor in uh, a, the, uh, the leading gold mining city in the country, Obwasi, where I was a mayor for some time. And um, later on, I moved into another another district as a mayor. So um, my public service life mainly uh, was for many years, 15, 18 years as a mayor. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, so I, I really have a keen interest in local governance, the challenges and opportunities, uh, uh, all that uh, go with that. And um, along that line, uh, of work, I led the African local government organization, as well as uh, the vice president of the world local government body. Following that, uh, I was also um, appointed to a special advisory committee of the United Nations on local governance. So most of my, my work has been in local governance. Before I moved into national politics as a, as a member of parliament and then uh, in ministerial positions in three portfolios, local government, um, environment, science, technology, and innovation, and then to the president's office as a minister of state, in charge of development authorities. Hmm. Um, so for the period of, um, from 1982 to 2017, I've been in public service. Wow. So yeah. with all this, um, I had the, the privilege to interact with a, a number of international organizations such, such as Trans Montana Forum in Europe. I've been also uh, been active with uh, the Rainbow Push Coalition uh, uh, led by Reverend uh, Jesse Jackson Sr. And um, for which uh, uh, I was awarded awarded uh, for, honored with a, an award for my advocacy for Africa's growth mm -hmm. and um, emergence at the global stage by the Wall Street Economic Summit, which is uh, before COVID annually organized by um, Reverend Jackson's organization. Mm -hmm. um, apart from that, there are other international organizations that have given me the platform to advocate for Africa's growth and uh, sustainable development. So um, 
I set up this uh, Africa Growth Solutions. It's an advisory uh, uh, unit of the main organization, Africa Global Emergence Center, to carry on with the work of uh, advocating for Africa's role at the world stage. So in, in brief, uh, this uh, what I've been doing, um, <laughs> post, post active political work in Ghana, uh, I've, I've uh, also devoted my time to advocating for Africa's growth, especially with the, with the, in terms of um, trade and investment. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, trade and investment is key to Africa's growth. So that, that's that's what I've been doing for some time now. Oh, I know we both have questions for you. Um, but I think from the standpoint of people understanding a little bit more in depth about the types of work that you do with trade and investment, can you give us some ideas around that? Is it strictly economic development oriented, commerce, commodities, trade, that sort of thing? Or... Give us, give us, uh, if you can talk about some of the projects you're working on, that would be great. Uh, recently, I was, uh, I was the keynote speaker for the UK Africa Trade and Investment Summit. Mm -hmm. And I made a case for, for Africa to rethink its uh, development strategies. Mm -hmm. If you keep repeating, what does not work for you, you need, you need to rethink it. The, the, I looked at China's strategy that has brought them where they are in leveraging their natural resources for infrastructure and technology. And I made a case for Africa that with all these abandoned natural resources, Africa needs to leverage the natural resources for the much needed infrastructure and technology that can help Africa to be competitive at the world level in terms of trade and investment. We've, we've set up the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, which seeks to, to encourage intra-Africa trade. But if you are not producing what you trade in, we, 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 we will still need to import and then distribute within Africa. If, if that's the case, then it's not worth the effort. Africa needs to be competitive in terms of the value additions to the resources. Mm -hmm. So these are the, the, the areas that have been, have been um, advocating that Africa needs to, to um, have the needed infrastructure, infrastructure in roads, in energy, in water, in, in technology, to be able to compete or have a share of the world trade. And as of now, Africa's share is just less than 3% of world trade. Mm -hmm. So where does it take Africa in terms of the, the value chain and the, the income that comes from world trade? So for me, Africa needs to rethink its development strategy, and that will also be linked to leadership and governance issues. Mm -hmm. Because the, the dysfunctional issues and challenges in leadership and governance that has given rise to major conflicts. And once it becomes a cycle of conflicts, poverty, disease, you'll not be able to be productive. Mm -hmm. But leadership is at the center of it. And these are areas that, for me, uh, when I get the, the platform, I advocate for, for the kind of leadership that will, will um, give us a functional governance system. 
I think that uh, what you're talking about sounds like there's still some policy adjustments and, and some leadership mindset shifts, like some paradigm shifts that need to happen. Ambassador, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, from uh, that, it's all uh, I concluded that uh, when the policies and strategies are not working, that we then we need to redesign and we have to find the gaps. Where are the problems which are not addressing the, the where are the gaps which are not addressing the proper solutions, uh, like the problem we are having, but we don't have the exact solution to fix it. Then I think uh, it is they are going in the correct uh, direction that they need to uh, redesign and restructure the policies and strategies uh, with, which can help in the sustainable development of Africa. As uh, the development is an ongoing process, but now when we have a target of sustainable development, when we are suffering from the environmental changes, and uh, of course, Africa has also uh, cultural uh, challenges, environmental challenges, and with the passage of time, yeah, it's just also economic challenges. So it is best solution to redesign and rethink that how we can fix it. Yeah, so Akwasi, I think that um, from perspectives outside of Africa, sometimes it feels as though that there's a trust issue that needs to be, um, you know, that's a gap, <laughs> the trust uh, in order to do the right business because there are policies in place at these local governments that really are not conducive to doing business the way that say Western world, you know, uh, other people are doing it. And so there's this non meeting of the minds when there is the potential to do business, but for some reason there's this roadblock that's happening. And I think that being able to open those roadblocks is gonna take some, some serious work and some also some idea shifting um, on the part of the leaders that, that, they, that they do need to make those changes instead of looking at always um, where's, where's the money and the bottom line and you know all of this that they take care of themselves. It's, you're not gonna to get to the economy you wanna to get to by making it hard on people to do business with you, you know? Um, what are your thoughts on maybe certain things that need to happen even this from this point forward that would open those doors to trade and commerce in a, in a better way? Yes, um, there is always the, the view that doing business in Africa is a high risk venture because the, the, the perception out there is of conflict. And of course, bad news travels very fast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's it it's of co conflict, but there's conflict everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, day in and day out, there are contestation of issues and uh, uh, various um, uh, internal, internal conflicts in countries around the world. But it's the way that it is managed. So um, this view out there does not encourage investment. I was, as I said, I, 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 before COVID, I used to do a lot of work with, uh, with uh, Jesse Jackson's, uh, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson's organization. And I, do, I used to present the view uh, as it is here. And uh, in one of the, the conferences, I only carried the US State Department's report mm -hmm. on various countries in Africa in, uh, in terms of uh, the investment climate. And they were surprised that even the US State Department gave a very good account of most of the countries. You know, but to them, it's all in the, the presentation out there of a continent of um, crisis and conflict and poverty and disease and all that, and the bad governance, of course. So um, that needs to be worked on, that uh, it's not wholly true that, that that is the situation. 
of course, there are challenges that need to be addressed with leadership and, and uh, governance issues. But as of now, most countries are, are in democratic uh, um, experiences and uh, transitions. Of course, uh, some challenges come up sometimes, but it's all part of the of, of the um, governance experiments. So those issues need to be to be addressed, and um, need the 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 mindset need to shift towards um, a kind of. Uh, independence, doing things for ourselves. There's always the, the expectation that some advanced countries need to always step in. Mm -hmm. But once that mindset of uh, we can do is, uh, is planted, mm -hmm. I believe we can, we, we can uh, move forward and uh, uh, rise, as we say, we always say Africa is rising. So that's, that's my take on that. We, we need to, to look within ourselves for the solutions. And one of such areas that of late I've been, I've been uh, uh, working on is entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. We need to incorporate in the minds of the people that we, we need we, we have to create wealth through entrepreneurial skills and mindset yeah. instead of us instead of um, being job seekers especially with the youth who are coming graduating in their numbers expecting to be to be employed right from the onset we need to inculcate that value of uh, being job creators rather than being job seekers. Yeah. So that's one area that I've been working on and uh, preparing um, various uh, 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 groupings to, to team up with me in creating that awareness that the public sector cannot do it all the majority of in countries where the economies grow, it's more of the private sector mm -hmm. and the jobs that they create. And, uh, and what government does is to support with infrastructure and the regulations regime. But it's the private sector that is the engine of growth of every country's economy. Yes. And we need to, to factor that in our development agenda. We need to encourage the private sector. We need to get the youth who are now, uh, because of uh, unemployment, have become a threat within their countries to, to, to embrace the idea that they are going out to create jobs and not to be job seekers. Yeah. And that on the, on the other side, government needs to put in the necessary support system to encourage people to create jobs for themselves and others. Yeah, true. Um, I have one more question then I'm gonna turn the floor over to Ambassador Khan because I know she's probably got some questions. How open to new technology are the governments there that you're aware of? Um, you know, there are a lot of people with new tech that would like to put it in Africa, bring it to certain governments, and they're getting a lot of the, oh, this is great, but there's no follow through on that. What, what is your take on that? Yes, that's a, a critical area. As I mentioned, in terms of infrastructure, ICT is a big company. And um, recently, the vice president launched the um, Ghana's uh, digitized economy. Um, it's an area that uh, uh, technology is key. One of the, the pillars of my organization is the Africa Technology and Innovation Summit, mm -hmm. which will be which seeks to deal with the, the policy 
um, funding and uh, uh, and the component, components that will, will ground Africa's drive to industrialization through technology. Mm -hmm. So it's it's key, and uh, we are, we are looking at having having um, industrial parks, technology parks, as it's, it's uh, mm -hmm. being done in other countries, advanced countries. Yeah, we're all about innovation and work with a lot of I, the word disruptive sounds so negative that I hate to use it, but people who are who are utilizing, let's just say, creative means uh you know yes. inside technology i had a conversation this past week with a guy who's the executive director of the genomics and genomics institute out in california and they've figured out you know genomics is how you edit genes to to alleviate um this certain diseases well they figured out how to apply that to agriculture and so they want to it's called mm. CRISPR technology, and they want to bring that to Africa as a as a course for farmers to understand how you can genetically okay. improve crops so that they are resistant to mm. certain bacterial diseases mm. and climate situations. And it also their solution is very good for the climate because it impacts the carbon situation in a very positive way. But when you get an institute like that that's ready to push things forward, and, you know, in places like Africa, mm. it, that could be a game changer for agriculture as we know it. Exactly. Um, also talking exactly. to some people who are trying to help replace uh, far, uh, mining equipment in Africa with more you know, cost efficient and, and more just productive um, means of, of mining so that you can not leave a lot of the product on the ground, but actually make use of it and you know, sell more. Um, so there's all these different interesting technologies that are out there to, to move forward. I've got another one that is bringing forward data centers um, as being the kingpin, the sort of headquarters for a smart village situation. So, you know, no more of that connectivity problem <laughs> around, around the, you know, the continent where you, you get on a Zoom call like this and it goes away in five minutes. Or, you know, you're trying to have a phone conversation that's a business conversation with a colleague in Ni Nigeria and suddenly, boom, it all goes. And even Ambassador Khan and I have had that happen before where she is. Um, and then, the, you know, he's running around trying to find a generator to, <laughs> to get himself because the power went out. But uh, I'd say, you know, that's such a key thing that uh, we work with inside Africa. I, I'm glad to hear that you feel like that's, you know, one of your pillars. Um, Ambassador Khan, I'm going to revert to you as well and see what comments you might have or questions you might have for Akwasi. Yeah, I'll continue with uh, your comments that, yes, I'm working with the African youth, uh, even in the Federation of International Gender and Human Rights, because we have some ambassadors from there. And during our fellowship, a lot of um, uh, students were from there. I, uh, we are only three from Pakistan. Uh, so they uh, they really they were uh, mostly absent in uh, our zoom calls and meetings because of uh, uh, network issues uh, like uh, they cannot um, streamline their uh, zoom video calling and then they go toward the audio settings or sometimes they disappear and then they will ask for the recordings so yes uh, internet is the main thing uh, uh, technology is moving forward and very fast and the world is uh, moving around the technology even just for the second you cannot afford that if you don't have internet you cannot have your zoom meeting or the call the coming one and uh, during covid we are very much uh, reliable on uh, like we rely on these things uh, we cannot work without the internet so yes africa needs uh, more innovation in the technology and uh, uh, with the innovation and the technology they uh, that which you uh, mentioned just about the genes technology and the improvement in the agriculture yeah the world is moving toward that but we uh, i will suggest that they should uh, do more uh, modernization in the seeds but be careful about the organic product. Don't make it like uh, just increase the productivity, but and uh, on the other side, it will decrease the quality or uh, will have side effects on the health too. Sure. Yeah. So I have one uh, question that 
they uh, now they uh, we just talked about that we have uh, they are working on the entrepreneurship because need, african youth need to be uh, more dependent independent and they, they are not supposed to work on the government jobs are uh, and just asking for the job they should be a job creator so what are um, his plans about uh, providing is there any um, concessions or they have any uh, type of education for the entrepreneurship which directly uh, move them from uh, getting education and then uh, having their own business uh, set up just like incubation centers Kwasi, that's your question. Yeah, Mr. Kwasi, I am asking this yes, question. Yes, um, there are quite a number of uh, initiatives ongoing in Africa regarding um, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. um, mentorship programs, incubators, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, startup support, mm -hmm. right. and um, very interesting, interesting uh, projects that I've seen. And uh, it's quite encouraging. We need to step it up mm -hmm. uh, to to. Are governments putting money into it... programs like that? Yes, most of them governments uh, support. There are other um, multilat multilateral organizations, mm -hmm. uh, UNIDO, and others who are also involved in various activities mm -hmm. to support to support. Um, young entrepreneurs to support startups. And also um, recently the Commonwealth Ent Entrepreneurs Club invited me to be a member of, of the organization as a goodwill ambassador. And uh, mm -hmm. what they are trying to do is to link up various entrepreneurs around the Commonwealth so that they can share experiences mm -hmm. and uh, upscale. Uh, another organization that also invited me around the same time is uh, Exportum, a Canadian-based organization, but uh, it's global, and they want to establish in Ghana mm. and have a project here. What they want to also they want to do is to have uh, various various uh, companies within a certain category that they want to um, encourage to upscale, upscale their, upscale their, their um, activities to the global level of com competitiveness so that when they do that, they can also pull the smaller ones, the SMEs mm -hmm. along. Yeah. And uh, I, find their, I find their program very interesting because they, they have the, the um, human resource to assist these companies to upscale as well as risk and upscaling of, mm -hmm. of their human resource capacity. Yeah. Which, which, which uh, I believe will, will be great if, uh, once we establish here. When we do that, uh, as a pilot, will be replicating in some African countries. Okay, that's great. Um, you know, something that came to mind is uh, I interviewed a gentleman with an organization in, um, I think it was Nigeria some time ago. And what they do is they work with CSO, civil society organizations, uh, which, are, which okay. I guess is a lower level of NGOs. They're kind of the, the smaller charity organizations. And he said in their country, they had about 5,000 of them. Only 3% were organized in a way that they could take advantage of the grant programs that are coming from the larger NGOs. If they went through his mm. programs where, they're, where they can help you set up your budget, make sure your, you know, your structure is correct because nobody's going to give you money if you don't have a budget and a structure and that sort of thing. Um, so there's a bunch of protocols they'd have to go through and policies they'd have to have in place so that no one person's over all the money. <laughs> you know, you have a checkpoint mm -hmm. across from somebody mm -hmm. who's handling the money. 
um, so that you have a proper operational nonprofit organization, then they would make a referral of your organization to a grant maker. And you are much more likely to be able to get the grants. Uh, so it's a shame there's that many organizations out there struggling for money to do good works. And by, I call them entrepreneurs, they're just social entrepreneurs. Some of them are, are doing it with a, a for-profit end of it and others are doing with a nonprofit. And, but uh, what a shame that they are not able to have the skills because to me, I've been a nonprofit leader before and I understand the skills are almost the same in nonprofit as they are in business. You still have to have the proper you know, mindset and protocols and you know, uh, structure in place. Exactly. Um, to be able to run an operation and being able to have those entrepreneurs, like you call them, SMEs, the small businesses, um, to me, to lump in also those, you know, those small charities to be able to have the entrepreneurial help to understand about budgets and projections and, you know, reporting and, and that sort of thing, I think is really good. The one thing I do know that's happening in the United States, and I'm hearing it happen in Africa too, that if they have a no, nonprofit or a for-profit in the, in the future, they'll end up having the other, the, the yin and the yang. They'll have the for-profit and then have the nonprofit later, the foundation or something, or vice versa. Um, so I'm seeing that happen a lot. And I've been pushed myself to almost creating that nonprofit arm to what I do. Um, but I've been in nonprofit work and I'm not happy to do both right now. So too much, you know, to do, no problem, yeah. but I'd say that, you know, that's, that's another big thing going on after you've got a, a huge continent with an enormous heart. There's just so many people trying mm -hmm. to do good works out there and trying to create their own entities doing it, that it's exactly. a shame not to include exactly. them in the mix of things. So they're not always seeking money from other sources that they figure out how to sustain themselves. And the sustaining part begins with their own leadership and capability. And so while you're, while you're training exactly. entrepreneurs to have their leadership and business sense to be able to create their businesses, I think that, that somehow there has to be an arm of that for those people who are trying to um, do well by doing good, <laughs> you know, the social exactly. entrepreneurship end of exactly. things. Um, what, what's coming to mind is a conversation with a guy from, uh, who's a youth advisor with the government of, T uh, Tanzania, who is trying to do some things with innovation and is, has got his mm -hmm. mindset solidly on, on promoting youth and entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, to solve their own problems, right. Um, to, to juice them up, to, to kind of think in that direction and understanding that there's just such a need there for, um, the, uh, you know, that impact piece of people who are trying to solve problems that don't have the wherewithal to do it. So I think that would be awesome. So I'm going to end on uh, who do you need? Who do you need to help you move forward? Are there partners and collaborators out there that you're thinking of that yes. help you? Okay. You share with us and, and Ambassador and I will take notes. <laughs> yes. Um, we need uh, some promoters. Promoters, because um, with with the, the the key pillars that I've outlined in my my vision, um, certainly we we'll need some promoters who will link link these pillars to 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 people and organizations that will buy into, into these programs. For instance, um, I mentioned um, Africa Technology and Innovation Summit that seeks to, to promote, promote and then and encourage um, technology helps if there is a promoter we can we can uh, uh, get things moving because uh, the promoter knowing the various uh, interests could help us link link up with with uh, such organizations that Will, will buy into this concept of um, technology innovation hubs and uh, parks 
in mm -hmm. Africa. So that, that's that's uh, one uh, area I, I'm looking at. Um, and then and then uh, the the multilateral agencies that have an interest. For instance, I, I am aware UNIDO is uh, doing a lot in terms of uh, entrepreneurship development and then the, and the industrial parks. That's uh, a very uh, uh, great source of support that I'll be I'll be looking at. And um. I'm looking at uh, human capacity, human capital development, human capital development, which is key mm -hmm. to realizing and actualizing Africa's development agenda. Day in and day out, uh, as uh, you, you said, disruption, but I also have have uh, a kind of uh, reaction to that, uh, more like create creativity. New things are happening yeah. from, from uh, up to uh, four IR, the fourth industrial revolution and all the things around it, internet of things and all that. It, it gets so confusing and uh, we need to get people abreast with these new realities. And uh, if we don't develop the human capital, the natural resources that abound here mm -hmm. will not be put to the, the use that we, we want to do mm -hmm. in terms of um, going through the value chain. So we need to develop the human capital that will, will be able to complement mm -hmm. the resources. Yeah. So that's another area that I'm looking at. How do we upscale and rescale the, the human resource base that we have here? Mm. Okay. So that's that's one area. Not not the 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 normal business as usual academics no. but more of a hands-on yes. practical yeah. practical uh, uh, skills acquisition yeah and i think that to be that's, able to be yeah sorry yeah, that's worldwide i think the thing is we we teach a lot about skills and not a lot about mm. uh using your brain <laughs> and your mind and your social skills and understanding yeah. diversity and understanding cultural differences and um i'm seeing that play out in in my own world because we do business development as how you know how accommodating you have to be and and kind of move yourself you know, flexible, you're, you know, be flexible about how you move through conversations and, um, you know, and, and just be a good human being about listening to see where there's gaps and how you can be of some help instead of always looking dollar bill first. And so it's, mm -hmm. I think it's important. That's how we're going to get ahead. I think you, you've hit the nail on the head with a lot of the things that you're looking for. Is there, is there anything, anybody else that you missed? <laughs> Any other people? Any other partners? Partners like you? Ah, well, you, got <laughs> you got us now. Obviously, partners like you. Yeah. Because um, as I keep on saying, um, we have what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And um, we also realize that there are those out somewhere who might be interested in what we want to do. Mm. For instance, um, one area that I, I work on is um, the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very keen on that. But then uh, there are also investors 
and uh, uh, who might be interested in project financing. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring the, the lenders and, uh, and the governments or the private entities who need the financing to be able to, to achieve their objective together. Mm -hmm. So that's one area that I, I look at. Uh, so we, we, can, we can discuss that further, uh, having this uh, platform of uh, a project finance marketplace where mm -hmm. the lenders, the brokers, and the entities mm -hmm. will come together and mm -hmm. then do business. Right. Um, you know, I think there's a technology out there that would assist with all of that that I don't know that has been adopted very much in Africa, but it's called blockchain. And I think it, it presents an opportunity yes. for trust to exist um, because everything's very transparent and clear. And I think that um, that is coming <laughs> if it hasn't already come to you. I think that would eliminate a lot of the chaos that goes on in trying to get deals to move forward. Um, and I think maybe you're right is with the human capital bit that you're talking about is being able to, to train up that next generation of either leaders, whether they be in corporate or government, and you know, and, and Ambassador Khan's doing her job with the young diplomats, but having the, all the right people in place that actually have the open mind, that have the global citizen mindset, and that also understand the value of technology and trying to incorporate that in a culture that so values its heritage its languages and all of that and being cognizant of the fact that it's not giving up things. It's just moving ahead and becoming a more sustainable continent. And so I think if we can all come together in that same mindset, we're really going to have something beautiful going on. So um, applaud you, Ekwasi, for all the good work you're doing. And I think what uh, Ambassador Khan mm -hmm. and I would like to do is have a separate conversation with you that's not an interview, but actually mm -hmm. a business conversation. <laughs> and we can okay. work okay. through some of those things together. Mm -hmm. But uh, I appreciate it so much. Mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing a few minutes with us that we can actually thank share you. to the public, to the world. And Ambassador Khan, thank you. You have any parting words, Ambassador Khan, for Ekwasi? Yeah, thank you so much. It, uh, it was a very interesting uh, discussion and I have uh, a lot of uh, things in my mind. Mm -hmm. Like when uh, the common thing is when the young boy or girl is employed just 16 or 18 years or maybe 20 years after getting her education and when she or he reached to the maximum level of their wisdom, 50 or 65, and the government are just get them a red flag that you are retired. <laughs> you know, you know it, it. It is the age. It is the time when that person is saturated with the wisdom, saturated with the experience, and we should we should get the benefit of these people to utilize their wisdom and utilize their experience. How they, because it is a long passage of twenty to third thirty to forty years of experience which he gained. So, like just you said that. Uh, investment in the human resources. So human, uh, when we invest in a person who first graduated and come into the business or in any job, so when we invest him, so he is a capital asset for the company. Exactly. So exactly. yeah, it is the founding and founding brick. And uh, I think it is the strong brick of any uh, country. And you have to utilize these people and get the benefit from their uh, wisdom and the knowledge. Here we all see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> next year. Indirectly, so I'm <laughs> telling that we are here. <laughs> I think you're probably the youngest. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I found my most useful place at this age, uh, which is really yes. odd, but it's a culmination of a lot of different experiences that gets you to mm. where you are. Uh, and I'm still growing. I just took a class, a Harvard class not long ago. And, you know, I've, I learned a bunch of these things that I did not yeah. think about with leadership. So um, you never know what you're going to learn going forward. But uh, I want to say goodbye to everybody because we've got another call coming up. But Akwasi, this has been wonderful. And I will get back to you about scheduling another chat with the two of us, if that works for you. Okay.
that we look right. forward to that because right. we both have some ideas sure. for you and we can kind of sure. you know, see brainstorm and see what okay. we can do from there to help you. you can, and uh, Ambassador Khan, thank you once again. And I will see you in a few minutes here. Okay. So thank everybody, you so if, you're watching have a great on, day. <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube, go to www.frontrunnersinterview.com where you'll see this interview and some information. And Akwasi will ask for your, uh, you know, some links that you'll provide us for your business and any social mm -hmm. and your headshot. And if you have, and I know you do, a speaker's bio, I'd love to have that too. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.